So this talk is part of the Health at Google speaker series. Have folks been to the speaker series before for other talks? A couple of them, great. Um, so again, what we're trying to do is just provide Googlers with more information on health and wellness. Uh, and we're actually also looking for wellness champions. So if you're interested in becoming involved in the work that we're doing, not just with the Health at Talks, but other initiatives, let us know. Um, and I think with that, no other logistics, just happy to introduce Dr. Michelle Cow. Um, she's an assistant professor in the Division of Sleep Medicine at Stanford. Uh, her clinical focus is on sleep disorder breathing, such as obstructive sleep apnea, central sleep apnea, and positive airway pressure devices for sleep apnea treatment. So quite a lot there. Um, with a background in critical care and pulmonary medicine, Dr. Cow has a special interest in patients with combined pulmonary disease and sleep disorder breathing. So with that, we're excited to have her here today to talk about sleep apnea. Thank you for inviting me. Wow, you know, I've been to the Facebook um, headquarters, but this is a different world. <laughs> All right, um, so as you know, I'm one of the uh, clinicians at the Stanford Sleep Clinic. And um, I, uh, many of you have maybe, well maybe have you seen me before there if you're a patient there. Okay, so how many of you have heard of sleep apnea in this building? Good, okay. All right, so let's just start out what, with the question, what is sleep apnea? Um, it's a medical condition that that's, uh, basically is abnormal breathing during sleep. And it was first discovered by Dr. Christian Gimino at the Stanford uh, University with his colleagues in the 1970s. And um, what it is is that it's repetitive episodes of airway obstruction or your, the upper uh, airway collapse during sleep. And this can happen several times an hour versus, or it can happen 100 times an hour. So that's the severity depending on how often it happens. The episodes happen because um, the muscles in your throat or your airway are relaxed during sleep, so that causes the obstruction. And the obstruction of the airway causes um, either a, a blood oxygen level drop or a brain arousal. Um, the other thing that happens is that when you fall asleep and you uh, sleep on your back, your tongue also falls backwards because of gravity and that blocks up the airway as well. Okay, so looking at this um, picture, you can see that, I don't have a pointer, but you can see that the, the person is lying down and, and looking at the blue arrows, you can see that the air is going in as the person's breathing and at the very bottom where it says blocked airway. So when you sleep at night, if you have a small windpipe or airway, even though air is going, trying to go through and you're trying to breathe, it's completely blocked. So it's a mechanical obstruction and that's what sleep apnea is. Okay, so just some, uh, some facts behind this disease. Um, the very first major U.S. population-based study, and it was done on middle-aged adults in Wisconsin in 1993, showed that 24% of men and 9% of women met criteria for sleep apnea. Now, these numbers underestimate the current prevalence figures that we have now. In 2006, the National Sleep Foundation indicated that as many as one in four American adults met criteria for uh, a high pretest probability of sleep apnea. That's, that's pretty big. Um, the, despite what we know about sleep apnea today, we think that about 70 to 80% of people are undiagnosed so far still. Many people are unaware of the symptoms of sleep apnea, and we need to increase our knowledge um, of the risk factors and the symptoms, and the physicians have to also be aware in diagnosing um, this disease and getting patients treated. So I'm gonna go over some myths that we've heard about sleep apnea, and many of you have, may have had um, this belief as well. So number one, sleep apnea only affects people who are overweight or obese. Okay, this is absolutely not true. If you are obese, you are at much higher risk. However, you can be fit, you can be thin, you can be a very, even you know, anorexic and still have sleep apnea. Um, number two, sleep apnea only affects men. Now, it's more common in men, and it's more common in postmenopausal women. However, anyone is at risk for this disease. It can happen in any age, even in, in you know, one to two year olds. Um, women women are, much, are much less likely to seek help, um, just because of the stigmata and, and the awareness. Um, and also, women, women have different symptoms. They don't present with the classic symptoms that we know of. They come in with insomnia, fatigue, tiredness, depression, 
um, rest to sleep, and they and all, all that are very nonspecific symptoms, and it can be blamed on even just you know stressors in life. Uh, the other, the next myth is sleep apnea always causes daytime sleepiness. So not everyone with sleep apnea feels sleepy during the day. And the severity of sleep apnea does not correlate with the symptoms. In other words, you can have mild sleep apnea and have very severe symptoms, and you can have very severe sleep apnea and not have symptoms at all. So even if you have mild sleep apnea, it should be taken seriously. Um, it can increase the risk of heart disease and other health problems, and uh, it will progress to, to, to severe sleep apnea over time. Okay, so this is a very common myth. Sleep apnea is just loud snoring. Okay, so it is much more serious than loud snoring. Um, in fact, snoring is a warning sign that you have some degree of obstruction to airflow during sleep. Um, when you snore, it means that you're trying to get air in, but something is not right. Otherwise, you shouldn't be snoring. So snoring is never normal. If you snore, please seek evaluation. See a doctor, tell them you snore. Now, the other thing is, you don't have to snore to have sleep apnea. There are many people who never snore but have sleep apnea, okay? So that's the other um, myth. Now, the, um, the, the next myth is OSA or sleep apnea does not need to be treated, okay? So again, sleep apnea increases the risk of having heart diseases such as high blood pressure, heart attacks, heart failure, arrhythmias, and sudden cardiac death. It also increases risk of other medical conditions, strokes, diabetes, depression, um, it causes daytime sleepiness, and therefore people can get in car accidents. And treating sleep apnea will lead to a dramatic improvement in quality of life. So um, the very common myth that I hear with my patients is you can have snoring without having sleep apnea. And I just want to stress again that snoring is always abnormal. Okay? It is a sound that ma that's made in your throat when air is trying to flow in, but it's blocked. Um, and then snoring can also stop during the night if, you, if your airway is suddenly occluded and then you can't breathe. Um, so snoring may be the only sign that you have that you know that you have sleep apnea, so please see a doctor if, if you chronically or habitually snore. Okay, so the spectrum of, of sleep apnea, I just want to um, emphasize this because sleep apnea is sleep apnea, but then there's different you know, severity and degree of, of severity. The, the very um, mildest form of sleep apnea is actually called UARS, and that stands for Upper Airway Resistance Syndrome. And again, it's the emphasis on upper airway resistance, so it's resistance to airflow. And then the, there's a, you know, the, obviously the very severe form of sleep apnea. And these numbers are the AHI, I'll go into it later, but it's basically a, a marker of severity. And if you happen to have a sleep study, these numbers will become very important. So I'm going to talk about the upper airway resistance syndrome first, um, because I think it affects younger people, younger population, and especially women. Um, so on a sleep study, what you're going to see is um, basically you're going to see snoring, um, some airflow limitation, and just brain arousals. And that's what the physician is going to see on a sleep study. Now, these findings are actually very subtle on a sleep study compared to a typical severe sleep apnea patient. And what we're looking for is what we call a respiratory effort-related arousal um, during a sleep study. And um, this is actually detected by a very special monitor. It's called the esophageal pressure transducer. The reason why I want to mention it is because not many sleep studies have this monitor. Um, and if you have symptoms of UARS, it is important that you ask for this monitor or you, you make sure that the physician looks into this or pay attention to it. The treatment options for URS patients are the same as for sleep apnea because it's just the degree of, of basically sleep apnea. And um, the, what I find in that the ongoing problem, I think, in the community is that many of these patients remain untreated and they continue to experience symptoms like insomnia, fatigue, depressed mood, you know, daytime tiredness, and they continue to see physicians, but um, they, they don't get diagnosed. Okay, so um, my slides are reversed, but I just want to uh, mention quickly, the UARS is also founded by Dr. Christian Gimino in the 1990s, who also founded sleep apnea. Um, and again, it's, it's seen in younger, healthy, other, otherwise very healthy individuals. Um, very common in young, thin females. And again, it, it presents with chronic daytime fatigue rather than sleepiness. 
Um, they also have insomnia, difficulty falling asleep and staying asleep. Some patients have depressed mood. Um, a lot of patients will have sleepwalking or night terrors or sleep talking. Those are the common symptoms. Um, they are very commonly misdiagnosed as fibromyalgia or chronic fatigue syndrome. Okay, so who gets sleep apnea? Anyone can get sleep apnea, men, women, kids, any age. So who is at risk for it, however? So if you're a male, you're at two or three times higher risk than women. So unfortunately, that's the case. <laughs> um, however, if, you, if you're a woman in, in menopausal or postmenopausal status, you're at a fourfold increased risk of sleep apnea compared to the premenopausal women. Women are less likely to complain of symptoms. Again, they complain of fatigue, morning headache, mood disturbance, insomnia. Um, older age, the older you get, the more likely your sleep apnea will be severe. If there's a positive family history of sleep apnea or snoring, um, ethnicity is very important here. So the studies have shown that African Americans and Asian are much high, have a much higher prevalence of sleep apnea compared to you know, Caucasian people. Um, certain craniofacial morphology, or basically certain bone structures in your face can predispose you to sleep apnea. Um, this is also very important is rhinitis or nasal congestion, whether you have like nasal allergies or even non, um, or non-allergic type of nasal congestion. Um, this, is, this increased your risk of sleep apnea. Um, obviously, if you're obese, the risk is very high. During pregnancy, you can have an increased risk of sleep apnea. This is very important for women who are trying to get pregnant because it can cause um, preeclampsia and, and complications during pregnancy. And then certain medications can do it as well. So I just, this is a list of basically the different um, physical findings that we look for in someone who may have sleep apnea. And what it comes down to is basically um, if you have a small upper airway, it increases your risk of having sleep apnea. And this is why it ties into the, the you know, Asian, um, Asian uh, feature, the Asian facial feature as well as African American. So when we see a patient in clinic, what we're looking at is someone who has um, what we call a small lower jaw or a, um, a short lower jaw, a recessive jaw. Um, your upper jaw, that's, if that's recessive or small or flattened, that's a risk for sleep apnea. There's a lot of soft tissue in the back of your throat, like big tonsils or big adenoids. Um, this is very important, a narrow nasal passage. So this can be due to anatomic. As it, so for instance, if you're born with a deviated septum or maybe you got in a fight and you broke your nose but you didn't get it, uh, didn't get it fixed, um, or if you have allergies and your turbinates, which are the filters in your nose, are enlarged. Um, also, there's um, the, the nasal valves are the, the two valves right here at the tip of your nose, and if those things are collapsed and you're born with that, that can also uh, cause resistance to airflow. So all these things can actually cause um, or increase your risk of having sleep apnea. Okay. Okay, so here's a, a, a side view look of someone who is normal on the, uh, someone with, on the blue, and it's, it's it's, it's subtle, but if you look closely, you can see that um, the, the, the narrow part, the, the part in blue, that's, and, and I circled it, it's actually um, wider than the person on the right who has sleep apnea. Can you guys appreciate that? Okay, so looking at the side view, and this is how we know someone is predisposed to or probably has sleep apnea or is at risk for sleep apnea. And look at the jaw structure at the very bottom. You can see that the, per the person on the left side, the jaw is aligned with the nose. If you, if you put a ruler and you, um, you know, just put a ruler on the side, you can see that everything li lines up nicely. But on the right side, you see how the jaw is recessive, it's shorter and it's smaller. That is a risk factor for sleep apnea. Okay, so I just wanna show you the different uh, facial face morphologies in different people. And looking across the board, um, you know, some of these people have very big necks, and that's a huge risk factor for sleep apnea. And then um, some other people have a very small chin or a small jaw. So all of these people here have, have, are predisposed to sleep apnea. 
Okay, so this is looking inside the mouth and looking at looking at the, the top, the roof of the mouth, and um, it just you can you can just trust me that it's a very uh, uh, high and narrow heart, what we call a hard palate. So if you look up at, at the roof of your mouth, it should not be narrow like this. This is a very narrow hard palate, which is a big risk factor for sleep apnea. Okay, so this is these are uh, huge tonsils and a lot of soft tissue in the in the back of the throat. So this person is actually quite severe, but uh, on the average, if you have tonsils that are visible, um, it's going to take up some space in the, in the back of the throat and, and, in, and causes problems with airflow when you breathe and, and doing sleep. Okay, so this is hard to see, but the top picture is basically uh, looking at a video scope through the nose, and those bulging, um, structures coming out, those are turbinates, those are filters in your nose. We all have them. They get enlarged when you have nasal allergies or any kind of irritation to your nose. And you can see that, I mean, they're, they're, it's like a slit opening. There's no, there's no room for airflow, and that's the problem, okay? This is a big problem because it disturbs sleep, and it disturbs, um, it basically decreases airflow, and that, that, that is one of the definition of sleep apnea. Looking at the two bottom figures, both of these openings are abnormal. You can see that. You see how the openings are really narrow? I mean, the person is on the left especially. I mean, you can barely get air in that nose. Okay, so these people are probably mouth breathers. So people who breathe with their mouth are not normal. Okay, that's, not, that's an abnormal sign. It means that you have some airflow obstruction in your nose, and therefore you've learned or you compensate it by breathing with your mouth. So that's a warning sign that something is going on. Okay, so this is pretty severe here, okay, but this person probably can't get air in his nose at all, even when he's awake. Can you imagine when he's sleeping? It's probably a lot, a lot worse. Okay, so when we look at a, a patient in the clinic, we look at this scale called Malin Potty scale, and, and it's one through four, and it tells us the severity of how crowded the airway is. So when this, we look at this person opening his mouth at a natural state, just saying, you know, open your mouth, all I can see is the huge tongue. I can't see anything else. Normally, I can see all the way in the back of the throat. And so this is a, a, a severe a patient who has a, the most severe form of, of, of uh, airway crowdedness. His, his airway is very crowded. Okay, so quickly on uh, obesity and, and sleep apnea. So you consider overweight if your body mass index is 25 or higher. Um, and it, it is the strongest risk factor for sleep apnea. Now 10% of, of your weight gain, of whatever your weight is, 10% of weight gain is associated with a six-fold increased risk for sleep apnea. That's pretty big. The next circumference is a, it's a strong predictor for sleep apnea. So in our clinic, we always measure the next circumference. For a male neck size, 17 inches or greater is a problem. For females, it's 16 inches or greater. The other, um, the other part of the body that we look at is the abdominal fat. If you are obese and it's, the, the fat is mainly located in your belly, you are going to have problems because when you lay down flat on your back, that belly fat basically pushes up on your diaphragm and it takes up space and the lung can expand. And therefore, not only are you, is your upper airway already collapsing from sleep apnea, but now your lungs can expand. So your oxygen is gonna drop even more so. So obesity is just, it's just, a, it's just bad news. Okay, so what about sleep apnea and nasal obstruction? So I wanna focus on nasal obstruction because I think a lot of younger people have allergies, um, seasonal environmental allergies, and the, a lot of people are chronically nasally congested. Um, so rhinitis is the official term for, for basically allergic or non-allergic type um, congestion. And then there's the sinusitis as well. Um, nasal congestion causes uh, pathologic, pathologic changes in airflow and, in, and it increases airflow resistance. Uh, those with chronic rhinitis are more likely to report habitual snoring, chronic daytime sleepiness, daytime fatigue, and non-restorative sleep. And then those with nasal congestion due to allergies are twice as likely to have moderate to severe sleep apnea than those without. So if you have nasal congestion, please, come, please get evaluated. This is a study done a while ago, but I just want to show you um, the significance of it. So on the left side where it says sleep, the column for sleep problem, there's chronic snoring, excessive daytime sleepiness, and non-restorative sleep. And if you go over towards the right side, 
this is basically the frequency of nighttime symptoms um, of someone who has nasal congestion. And if you look at the where it's circled, um, basically people who have uh, persistent nighttime symptoms such as, you know, just like nasal congestion, um, have a high um, percentage of having snoring, daytime sleepiness, and non-restorative sleep. So this study was done, um, and the, the total number of patients was 4,927. So looking at this, where it's circled, 47% of these people actually complain of chronic snoring, and then 30% of these people complain of daytime sleepiness, and 37% of people complain of uh, non-restorative sleep. If you look at the column that says never, basically it's, you know, it's almost um, uh, less, uh, it's, it's significantly lessened. So it shows you that when you have nasal congestion, symptoms of rhinitis, it definitely can disturb sleep and um, cause uh, symptoms of sleep apnea. Okay. So um, one of the things I want to point out is, is allergies or nasal congestion is very common in kids. Okay. And um, so p kids who have abnormal breathing during their development phase, which is basically, you know, from, from, from birth until 18 years old, they um, are predisposed to facial features that will increase the risk for sleep apnea later on in life. So if you are a chronic nasal, if you have chronic nasal congestion, it leads to chronic mouth breathing, right? Because you can't get air in your nose, so you, you become a mouth breather. And then mouth breathing causes certain facial growth abnormalities. It actually, de it, it causes your lower jaw and your upper jaw especially not to grow as well as it should be. So that predisposes to sleep apnea. I remember before I, I commented on how important the jaw structure is in sleep apnea, and this is one of the problems, is that if you have chronic nasal congestion as a child, you, your, your jaw bones do not grow appropriately, and that is one of the problems um, that can lead, later on in life, lead to something like sleep apnea. Um, so the, the, the Mac, the um, upper and lower jaw structure are the what we call the maxillomandibular bone. And for people with mouth, chronic mouth breathing, their face eventually, it, they, they tend to be much more narrow and long because of the abnormal growth of the bone. Okay, so um, it's a vicious cycle because, so kids have nasal congestion, their bones don't grow, their facial bones don't grow appropriately, so then they, ended up, they end up having you know, sleep apnea down later on in life, and then they have sleep apnea now, so it's a vicious cycle because they, have, they don't breathe well, period. So it, you, you wanna you know, pay attention to these problems um, early on. So this is a picture of a, of a patient who, if you look at his, um, his it's hard to, to appreciate, but the upper bone, the upper jaw is flat. Okay, you can see it better on the side view. And you can also see in the side view that his jaw, his lower jaw is, is small and is short. Okay, and that's, this is a kid who has chronic allergies. And you look at his nose, it's, it's actually quite narrow too. Okay, so this is another uh, kid. Um, who has nasal congestion and uh, sleep apnea. If you look at his nose, it looks like it's pretty congested. And you can see that he's a mouth breather because even uh, during awake, his mouth is open. Okay, he has braces, but once, so we, we, we treated this kid for sleep apnea and allergies. And you can see that on the, on the right side, his nose is much more open now. And he's able to close his, his mouth now. And this is, this is actually at the natural state. We ask them just you know, to be as they are, and then we take pictures. But you can see the difference between the facial structure of this, um, this kid pre and post. Okay. So this is just to show you that family history matters because this is a father who has significant sleep apnea. Look at his jaw on the side, his lower jaw. It is tiny. Okay. That is a big problem right there. And then you look at the, his, his, uh, his son and it's the same structure. So we always ask for family history because usually you have the same bone structures as your parents do. If your parents know to have sleep apnea, most likely you will too. Okay, so how do, how do you know if you have sleep apnea? Okay, so these are some of the very common symptoms 
Um, you don't have to have all of it. You may have just one or two. But um, let me just go down the list. So chronic snoring, okay, that's the easiest sign to know that you may have sleep apnea. If you wake up from sleep with a choking sound or gasping for breath, if you have witnessed apneas, basically it means you stop breathing intermittently during sleep. A lot of times the, the bed partner will kind of nudge you with the elbow to say, you know, get, wake up, wake up and breathe because you're not breathing. Um, if you wake up throughout the night, if you unintentionally fall asleep during the day, such as this, this is what daytime sleepiness is, um, even if you have a full night's sleep, you still wake up feeling unrefreshed. Okay, that's, that's, something's going on because if you, if you had a full night's sleep, you should wake up feeling very rested and ready to go. Um, chronic daytime fatigue or tiredness, insomnia, morning headaches, that's because your oxygen level is so low during the night that you have headaches in the morning. Um, if a family member has sleep apnea, and then also if you have high blood pressure, which is called hypertension. So how is it diagnosed? It's diagnosed by an overnight sleep study that's interpreted by a sleep specialist. So just, just quickly, um, when we look at a sleep study, just you know, for any of you who's interested, we look at this number called the AHI, and it's called the apnea hypopnea index. And basically, it's, it's the different types of abnormal breathing pro, uh, events during the night. And sometimes it's called the RDI. Now, the, the AHI is an index, so we basically um, count up all the different, the total number of, of events of abnormal breathing events at night, and then we divide it by the total number of hours that you sleep, and we get an index. So the index is how we measure sleep apnea. And just quickly, there's a scale. Um, anything less than five is normal. Between five and 15 is mild. Between 16 and 30 is moderate. And anything greater than 30 is considered severe. I have patients who have numbers in the you know teens range, and I have patients who have numbers in the hundreds range, like 150 to, to you know 150 or higher, so you can see the severity is it's very wide. Um, we also look at the, the blood oxygen level as well as the presence or absence of snoring. Okay, so this, this is one of my patients who went through a sleep study, and I just thought I'd show it because you know, it's, it's, it's actually, you know, she's, she's pretty cute looking here. But we look at um, um, a lot of different uh, features um, uh, on the sleep study. We look at brain activity, we look at airflow, of course, through the nose, the mouth, we look at your um, muscle ex excursion. We look at the heart rate. Um, we look at several other parameters as well. OK, so um, I want to go over why is it so important to get sleep apnea treated. Okay, So the, one of the, mo the most important one is heart disease. It is um, very, uh, the, the, the data is ve it's, it's very strong on the correlation between sleep apnea and heart disease. Um, number one is high blood pressure. So let's go over some of the, the risks, um, the numbers and the risk. So you're at threefold increased risk of having high blood pressure if you have sleep apnea. And it is also related to the severity of sleep apnea. And we see this in kids as well and young adults. I have teenagers and 20 year olds who come into my office because of high blood pressure. Um, and, and when you treat their sleep apnea, it normalizes. Okay, so on, continue with heart disease. So if, you're, if you have severe sleep apnea, you're at a two-fold increased risk of having heart attacks or cardiac death uh, during the night. And you're at a 2.5, 2.4-fold uh, increased risk of having heart failure, as well as um, cardiac arrhythmias, such as atrial fibrillation. Uh, maybe you've heard that before. So this is just a, um, a study looking at the, um, the, the uh, cardiac events um, for based on the severity of sleep apnea. Okay, so looking at the different bars, looking at the controls, um, the cardiac events is pretty low. It's less than 0.5. And then when you go higher and higher to untreated severe OSA, the um, risk is, is you know, tripled, quadrupled. Okay, and then when you go at the, at the very last bar, looking at sleep apnea and CPAP, CPAP is a treatment for sleep apnea. You can see that we bring down the risk um, pretty significantly. Okay, so next uh, impact on health is stroke. Um, stroke, for you, many of you who, don't, who may not know, is it's basically, a, instead of a heart attack, it's a brain attack and it occurs when blood flow to the brain is interrupted. And this can be either a blood clot or it can be an artery that's broken and causing bleeding in the brain. Um, so if you have sleep apnea, you're at a two-fold increased risk of having a stroke 
like a pre-stroke event or um, basically all-cause mortality or death. And severe sleep apnea, in, it, um, if you have severe sleep apnea, it, it, you have a threefold or higher increased risk of having a stroke or, or death. So some of the other health-related um, consequences of sleep apnea, diabetes. Uh, studies have shown that sleep apnea can cause um, problems with, with sugar control, insulin resistance, which is what we call type 2 diabetes. Um, obesity. Now, obesity causes or, or increases your risk of having sleep apnea. However, sleep apnea itself can promote weight gain because you don't have daytime energy and you're always so tired, so your physical activity is reduced. So it's kind of a, a, a bad cycle. Um, depression. This, this is actually very, very common. If you don't sleep well, um, you tend to, you know, your mood is much more affected. Um, and then there's also this cognitive dysfunction. So people with sleep apnea, you know, have memory, focus, concentration, um, decreased mental sharpness. And then for men, there's also erectile dysfunction. Okay, so how is sleep apnea treated? Um, the CPAP is called the Continuous Positive Airway Pressure, and that's the gold standard treatment. Basically, it's, it's the, this, this air pressure is delivered through a mask that you wear over your nose or your face, and it basically, it's pressurized air, and it blows into the back of the throat and down the airway, so it splints the airway open. So think of it as if you're just putting water through a hose and keeping the entire hose you know, um, uh, flowing nicely. So it's a similar concept. It's, it's a mechanical treatment. Um, so everyone requires a different type of CPAP setting. So you do need to go to, um, you need to do an overnight, what we call a CPAP titration sleep study to determine the optimal setting and the, the pressure and the mass choice. The other treatment option is um, dental appliance, and basically the dentist is, is someone who will help you with this. Um, the dental appliance is similar to like a, um, like a mouth guard or a retainer, but a little more bulky. And what it does is that it moves your jaw forward, your lower jaw forward when you sleep. And by doing that, it opens up the windpipe or the airway. Um, it doesn't work as well unless you have mild sleep apnea. I don't recommend it too much in moderate to severe. The, um, the other option is to do surgery. We call sleep apnea surgery. The one surgery that works very well is the jaw reconstruction surgery, otherwise known as maxillomandibular advancement, MMA surgery. Now this surgery works best and is most effective long term. And if you do this surgery, the chances that you won't have to use CPAP or dental appliance and your sleep apnea is treated is it's pretty high, it's about 95% plus. However, it is highly, highly dependent on the surgeon's experience and expertise. Okay, so the surgery is, is done as, um, it, we, we offer this surgery, however, um, it, it, is, it, it is very, very dependent on the expertise of the surgeon, so, but it works very well. The, um, the other surgery is nasal surgery. Now. This, this nasal surgery is very common, and I think it, it actually helps patients quite a bit because if you have a deviated septum or if you have enlarged um, those, those filters or turbinates in your, in your nose because of allergies, if you correct this, you can actually just breathe better, period, whether it's during the day, during the night. And if you're using CPAP and CPAP is pushing that air pressure in, you're going to feel better as well. So I think the nasal surgery is a very nice complementary surgery or treatment option for, um, for sleep apnea patients. There's another surgery called the throat or soft tissue surgery. And this surgery does not work very well and it really doesn't, um, it's not effective long term. Most, most if not all patients come back with sleep apnea down the road. Um, for the exception, if you have big tonsils, a lot of kids have big tonsils. That's, that's the exception. If you have big tonsils, those should be taken out because it will help open up the airway for airflow. Okay, so what about kids? Um, in kids, we actually recommend taking out the tonsils um, first and foremost. That's the most effective treatment. However, it usually doesn't work by itself. We, always, we, we tend to also have to combine it with what we called um, maxillary expansion. These are, expand if you, any of you have kids, you, you might know that these are just little uh, metal, but what they call butterflies, and they put them on the roof of the mouth and they expand the, the jaw because the kid's bones are still soft, so we can expand the jaw and make it wide and prevent sleep apnea down the road. Um, it's also very important to treat nasal congestion or allergies in kids, again, because remember that the, jaw, the bones do not grow 
normally if you have chronic nasal congestion and you're a chronic mouth breather. So it's very important to treat allergies. Very, very important. Um, and then CPAP if necessary. Okay, so I, I can't stress again how important it is to treat um, nasal congestion. Um, if you have allergies, please get an evaluation um, and treat. Um, weight loss is very important as well. Positional therapy helps. So remember how I said if you sleep on your back, it's the worst position because your windpipe is already closing down and now your, your uh, tongue, by, because of gravity, is pulling the tongue backwards and then it just closes up the, the airway as well. So if you can sleep on your side, um, that would be very important. And if you can sleep maybe like a 20, 30 degrees angle, that would help as well. Um, lifestyle modifications. Avoid alcohol three hours prior to bedtime. Alcohol relaxes the muscles and your brain. And it, in during sleep, if you relax the muscles even more so than it already is, it's going to cause more severe sleep apnea. Okay, so some take home points. Um, so obstructive sleep apnea is a medical problem of all age groups, okay? Kids, men, and women alike. Sleep apnea puts you at risk for motor vehicle accidents, cognitive dysfunction, heart diseases, strokes, diabetes, and depression. Typical signs include snoring, gasping, choking during sleep, you stop breathing during sleep, and daytime sleepiness. Snoring is a warning sign that you have some degree of abnormal breathing during sleep, and you do not have to snore to have sleep apnea. Younger patients have different symptoms. They complain more of daytime fatigue, daytime tiredness, insomnia, non-restorative sleep, and mood changes. In a child with symptoms suggested for sleep apnea, it is very important to evaluate and treat if positive in order to prevent consequences later on in life. A narrow and or crowded upper airway is a risk factor for sleep apnea. Nasal congestion or obstruction can lead to non-restorative sleep, breathing difficulties, and sleep apnea. See a doctor if you suffer from chronic daytime sleepiness, daytime fatigue, or insomnia. And please do not assume that it is due to life stressors and your life is very busy because it can be a medical problem that's causing those symptoms. Um, treatment of sleep apnea improves work performance and quality of life. And I think that's what I want to leave you guys with. Okay. So, uh, besides CPAP, the surgeries and the oral appliance, is there anything else one can do, like lose weight, do exercise? Is that effective? Shall I repeat the question, or it's okay that? Okay. So besides CPAP, so the question is besides CPAP, dental appliance and surgery, is there anything else someone can do for sleep apnea? Um, I think weight loss helps. I think um, exercise helps, but you cannot treat sleep apnea by weight loss or even weight, weight loss surgery like bariatric surgery alone. And when I go back to the reason why is because sleep apnea is due to the craniofacial structure. It's due to your anatomy, the jaw structure, the narrow jaw, you know, the windpipe. And so you don't have to be overweight to have sleep apnea. You can be very skinny and have sleep apnea. So I think weight loss will improve sleep apnea, but it will not cure it. And unfortunately, we don't, we don't have other treatment options as of yet besides the three you mentioned. So thanks a lot for your talk. Um, mm -hmm. picking ba piggybacking on that question a little bit uh, with different exercises to do, I think I read a New York Times article about a study about doing vocal exercise that strengthens the muscles in the back of the throat, uh, improving sleep apnea outcomes. Uh, can you comment on that? Sure. Um, there are, I, I think, one or two studies about uh, doing throat uh, muscle exercises to see if you can strengthen those muscles. Um, those studies are not, I, 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 those, they don't work. That's the bottom line. Um, the reason why is because you can strengthen your muscles as much as you can, but during sleep, the entire physiology um, completely changes, and all those muscles still relax, and it, it will still collapse. Um, so the wind, it, again, it's due to the windpipe. If you have a small, if the diameter of your windpipe is narrow to begin with, mm -hmm. um, even if you have strong muscles, it may not necessarily keep it open. So I, I, I know of those studies, but so far they have not panned out to be treatment options. Thanks. 
Um, I had two questions. One was, you showed a kid that you said uh, the before and after, how he was uh, breathing through his mouth and then um, later not. Can you comment on what treatment you used on him? And the second question I had was, um, let's say I went to get treated, what would be the next step? Uh, sure. I, I didn't get your first question. Can you repeat like it again? The, the kid that you showed um, that you treated, uh, from oh, uh, sure. what treatments were used? Okay, so in the, in the kid with the treatment who had uh, nasal obstruction as well as a narrow, you know, uh, open, his mouth was open because he couldn't get air through his nose. So that kid got um, tonsillectomy um, as well as a very aggressive nasal um, uh, allergy treatment and also uh, septoplasty and um, uh, turbinate uh, reduction. So basically, um, taking the tonsils out and um, opening up the, ne the nose by medications as well as surgery. I don't remember if that kid actually had maxillary expanders. He may have as well. And then the second question is, how, what do I do if I think I have sleep apnea? Right. So uh, you, can, uh, you, know, you can go see your primary care doctor and get a referral to a sleep specialist, or you can go, go to one of the, um, you can go to a sleep clinic or a sleep specialist directly and uh, get evaluated. So, I mean, I think that depends on your insurance, but, you know, some people get, go through their primary care doctor and let them know, and other people go straight to a, um, like, a sleep clinic, like, you know, for instance, you can come to, to my office and just make an appointment and get treated. Does that help? Okay. So, can you give more of the, uh, drill down on the statistics a little bit better? Uh, some of those numbers that we hear, like quarter of men, are for levels that are those for levels that don't require necessarily severe treatment? Like, f if you put a threshold at like above this level of severity, you want to use CPAP. What's the incidence of that in the population, and um, and what and what fraction of people with that level of severity go undiagnosed? Do you think? Do, do you know those? Okay, so. Um, so I, I think well, for, so to summarize, I think um, in terms of numbers. The more severe uh, sleep apnea is, the more the correlation is the more severe. The severity correlates with the heart disease incidence. So um, we don't know for sure if mild sleep apnea will increase risk of heart disease or other medical um, conditions. But we know that moderate, to, especially severe sleep apnea, will um, it has a very uh, high association with increasing that risk. Um, we also know that if the blood oxygen level drops, then that's also a bigger risk factor. Uh, so, 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 so I guess, uh, what percentage of the population, if they, if everybody, if 100% of people had sleep tests, what percentage would be recommended to use CPAP? So we recommend treatment regardless if uh, you are mild, moderate, or severe. The reason why is because, so for sure, if you have severe sleep apnea, let's say that AHI, that number that we look at, it's you know, 35 or 50, and your oxygen level is 80%, which is very severe. Um, you are at a much higher risk of having a heart attack or blood pressure or heart-related diseases down the road, okay? Um, if you- uh, so, so, so let me, let me I, I guess, what I was getting at is that I hear this number like 25% of men have it, and then I don't really think that the number of people using CPAP is anywhere near that, and I'm trying to understand the gap. Okay, okay. So, I, so first of all, anyone who has sleep apnea should be treated, whether you're mild, moderate, or severe. Um, CPAP is another issue. CPAP compliance or adherence is much is another topic in itself. And although everyone should be treated with CPAP or surgery, not everyone can wear CPAP. Does that help? No, I'm not answering your question. We can talk later after this, too. Okay. Hi, I have two questions. Um, one is about um, the throat surgery. So uh, two people in my family have had their tonsils removed, and, and they're very severe snorers. Do they still snore? Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, I never knew them before. Um, so I, do you still, like, if, if you have a family history of snoring, even if your tonsils are removed, do you still recommend that for children? Yeah, so first of all, um, remember I said, so snoring is never normal, right? So if you snore, you have some degree of abnormal breathing during sleep. Um, the, 
the soft tissue surgery, it's called the UPPP. Um, it, it stands for a long, long name, but um, tonsillectomy is part of that surgery, but tonsillectomy can be done by itself as well. So for kids, we can't do much else but take out the tonsils. A lot of kids have big tonsils because that's, that's the time when tonsils get big. And um, when the tonsils are too big, it, it, I mean, you open that mouth and you just see two big golf balls, right? Yeah. So that completely obstructs the, the air from flowing in nicely. So for kids, we take out the tonsils so they, they get good airflow, they sleep well, they grow well, or they grow, you know, they grow appropriately. Okay. But later on in life, they may still need um, further treatment for sleep apnea down the road. But okay. if you're an adult and you get um, soft tissues, soft tissue, uh, tissue surgery, there's a good chance, very high, very, there's a high chance that it did not cure sleep apnea and you will continue to snore or have sleep apnea down the road, if not right away, even after surgery. Okay, so the tonsillectomy may have been when they were children to, right. for the children's need, but not address their adult need. Right, okay. I mean, the, the tonsillectomy for them, if they did it when they were kids, might have helped them while they were kids, but as they get older, especially in, in boys, because they get muscle growth, they get, you know, the testosterone comes in, um, the tongue gets bigger, the muscles in the throat get bigger, and so boys tend to get sleep apnea as they, be, as they go into their, their growth spurt, like the, their teenage years up to adult life. Okay, and my other question is um, about the micronathia. I, um, my, my kids have the Pierre Robin sequence, so they already are starting with the small right, jaw. Right, right. Should I talk, like, we're talking to bunches of doctors, but I'm not sure which doctor I would talk to about that. Um, the jaw the reconstruction jaw. surgery? I, yeah. I mean, for, in general, for cosmetic reasons or for sleep apnea? For sleep apnea. I mean, they snore a lot. Okay. They're babies. So, I mean, the, there, there are several surgeons in the community. Um, the, the surgeon who I think does very good work is Dr. Casey Lee. And I can give you his information Okay, I'll um, stop by afterwards. afterwards. Thank sure. you. Okay. Hi. Um, kind of following on to the, the children development sure. issue, I'm wondering if there's sort of a sweet spot in terms of age for kids when to sort of detect it and treat it, like the kid that you had the before and after. I'm curious mm -hmm. what age he was at. Sure. Yeah. So um, I think th well, the main uh, problem with kids is that they get, once their tonsil starts to grow, then that's when the sleep apnea signs come out. Tonsils start growing at around one year old or, or later. So we don't really see kids with sleep apnea um, until they're about, I would say, at least one year or greater. And after that, I mean, the screening should be done every year. So there's really no age when, when things get worse. Um, you know, we see, we see kids from all the way from one years old all the way through 18 years old. Yeah, I guess I'm wondering in terms of like correcting and beating the cycle before it's sort of too late and you're using CPAP the rest of your life. Is yeah. there, you know, in terms of trying to prevent that, is it like sure. by the time you hit puberty or something? You or? know, so, so the, for kids, I, the, the, the best you can do is get tonsils out as well as um, doing the maxillary expansion, the orthodontic work. Yeah. Um, and that, and you know, some are more aggressive than others. But those are the two main treatment options for kids. And if that still doesn't take away the sleep apnea, then unfortunately they'll have to go on CPAP until they get 18, 18 years old. And at 18 years old or after, they can get the jaw surgery. So a lot of my young patients, um, if they don't, if they continue to have sleep apnea after tonsils are removed, after orthodontic work with maxillary expanders. Then I put them on CPAP temporarily for a year or two. And then once you get to 18 or 19, I put them through the jaw reconstruction surgery. And, and actually teenagers like that because they don't want to go to, C, you know, they don't want to go to college with CPAP. And they rather get something that's much more, you know, curative or long-term, which is the jaw reconstruction surgery. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So in terms of the CPAP compliance, um, I'm someone that's should be using it and, and don't. Um, mm -hmm. I wondered if you had any tips either in terms of actual machines or in terms of styles of masks that worked for people that just... Sure. CPAP compliance <laughs> is a huge topic. Um, a lot of people do well and a lot of people suffer as well. Um, there's no one... I mean, I, I, can, I can spend an hour trying to... I mean, telling you what you, what you could do to help. Um, what I recommend is we have, um, we have a CPAP class, if you're a Stanford patient, we have a CPAP class um, at Stanford, which I'm, I'm the director of, and we, what we do is we, it's like a boot camp for CPAP users, and I go over basically the, the nuts and bolts of CPAP, all the machines, how to put the mask on correctly, how to use which machine's best for you, um, all the troubleshooting, any problems you have along the way, 
um, that's what that's what that class is for. So I, I, I mean, I can talk to you for as well afterwards, um, just on if you have any, you know, just just simple questions. But in general, to in order to really help you with CPAP, I probably need a good hour or so. Okay, uh, could you speak to the um, absolute risk of uh, hemorrhagic stroke um, in the general population, and then what that is among sleep apnea sufferers with hypertension and sleep apnea sufferers without observable daytime hypertension? I'm sorry, so can you repeat the question again? Uh, could you mention the absolute population risk of hemorrhagic stroke um, in general? Of stroke. And, uh, hemorrhagic stroke in general, and then how that risk changes in a uh, population with uh, sleep apnea, um, with hypertension, and with sleep apnea but without hypertension. I didn't catch this. I heard stroke. Is there some, a specific type of stroke you're looking for? Oh, yes. Hemorrhagic stroke. Not the ischemic stroke. Oh, hemorrhagic stroke. Hemorrhagic stroke. Yeah, hemorrhagic hemorrhagic stroke. stroke. Okay. Yeah. So hemorrhagic stroke is um, uh, not as common in sleep apnea. Um, I don't know the percentage of or prevalence of hemorrhagic stroke in the general population. Um, so sleep apnea patients tend to have uh, ischemic stroke. Basically, one of their blood vessels get clotted off because they, sleep apnea patients have a lot of cardiac arrhythmias like atrial fibrillation, and that causes clots in the heart. And if one of those, if one of those clots you know, break up and go up into the brain, and that causes a stroke. So um, I actually don't know. The, I don't know if there's been studies looking at the prevalence of people with high blood pressure versus people with no high blood pressure and sleep apnea um, and the hemorrhagic stroke population. I don't think there are studies like that. In, I think there's only general population-based studies on the prevalence of stroke in sleep apnea patients. Sorry about that. Yeah. Okay. You talked a little bit about positional therapy, so mm -hmm. getting people back sleepers to start sleeping on their sides. Right. Uh, can you go in, into a little more depth about that and also maybe talk about certain pillows uh, people may recommend for sleep apnea? Yeah, so I don't recommend positional therapy, actually, because it's, it's not, using it by itself it does not work. Um, because you can still have sleep apnea on your side. It's just maybe less because the tongue's not in the way, right? So when you think about it, the tongue falls back. If you're in your back, gravity pulls the tongue back and it closes up the airway. So if you're on the side, then the tongue is falling to the side, not, not backwards completely. Um, there's no specific pillows that we recommend. However, there are patients of mine who will either... Um, tie a tennis ball to their t-shirt in the back of their t-shirt so that when you know so that when they sleep if they roll back to their back then the tennis ball's there and it's very uncomfortable so it teaches them not to roll on their back i had a patient who uses um a backpack to sleep so so uh he you know so he doesn't roll on his back and so he wears a backpack to sleep I have patients who will tie their hands to the post if they have a bed post, like a swimmer's position, like this, so then they can't row on their back. <laughs> but I don't recommend positional therapy alone for sleep apnea. I do recommend sleeping on an incline, though, about 20, 30 degrees like this. So there are wedge pillows that you can get, and you can get that on the internet, like Amazon or anywhere. Um, there's these pillows that you put on your bed and they just make it on an incline and that really helps too, especially if you don't have CPAP or other treatment um, on board yet. Oh, the other thing that I recommend is, um, have you heard of Breathe Right strips? So those are these strips you can get just over the counter at you know, CVS or Walgreens and there's different types, but what it does is that they, it basically it's this really, really um, thick, um, not thick, but sticky, um, sticker and it basically you put it right here and what it does is it basically keeps your nose open like this when you sleep and so remember I talked about the nasal valve collapse and the narrow nasal passage so these things basically keep it open like that and it actually really does help a lot of my patients love it especially if you have nasal congestion it really does help so I recommend that is there any reason not to use those every night oh you can use it every night I think that's that's you know it cannot it cannot hurt you it can only help you are there any foods that make uh, sleep apnea worse? worse? Yeah. No. Not unless your food has not unless food has alcohol in it. Um, <laughs> or or medications. Or jello shots. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so this is Google, so I have to ask the obligatory technology question. Sure. Um, I, I had a sleep study and 
my main, my main observation from the sleep study was just complete amazement that, you know, it's 2011, 2010, and there was no wireless. Like, wh why are, why are, when do you think all the sleep study equipment is actually going to stop using physical wires to connect the sleep study participants to the, to the monitors? <laughs> you, mean, you mean the sleep study the night that you have the sleep study? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's like a tangle of spaghetti that comes out of your head and your and your chest and, and stuff. I, it's just, mostly it's kind of humorous, I think, to, to people who, you know, walk around with a gazillion wireless devices on them all day. Yeah, I mean all those wires. Yeah, I don't know. You guys can design something. Uh, patient violation also. I don't know if, if it's wireless. I mean, anyone else can get it too, and we, people don't want their data. I guess I don't know, but you're right. That's that's really um, that's. <laughs> So nice question. question about, uh, you, you know, the compressed air in CPAP dries out the nose, so it can actually, um, it can actually irritate the nasal tissues yes. and accelerate the inflammation of the turbinates after yes. surgery so that it recurs. Yes. Um, do you have any comments on how to avoid that? Yeah, so uh, sometimes CPAP can actually, what, what he's saying that sometimes CPAP can actually irritate the, the mucosa lining of the nose because some nose... Some, mucos some mucosa are sensitive than others just you know, because of who you are. And for other people, if you have allergies especially, the mucosa can be very sensitive. And if you put that CPAP pressure, it's blowing into that nose and hitting that mucosa, the wall of the nose, it can actually irritate the nose more and cause rebound congestion. So then you're now you're making the problem worse by treatment, right? Um, one of the things we do is we, we, you have to use humidity. If you use humidity, because so the CPAP machines have high humidity. If you use that, it really does help the, the, um, the, the discomfort of, of that problem. And also, um, if you use lower pressure settings, it tends to help as well. Now, your, the pressure settings depends on how severe your sleep apnea is. But sometimes you kind of have to balance it out. If you have congestion and, and the, the CPAP pressure is irritating your nose, you have to lower it so you can get, you know, have more comfort and use it. But those are the, the two main things that I do for CPAP users with, with who are having problems with the CPAP pressure itself with the nose, um, short of, of actually treating the, the allergies more aggressively. So... Um, does, that, does that help? Okay. So... Obviously, the sleep study is the gold standard, and that's one of the reasons why people who use CPAP machines are, are initially and oftentimes as follow-ups will go back for follow-up sleep studies to see how well the machine is working. But obviously, more data points on how well the machine is working in between times to go and have a sleep study is good, right? And people can do things like track how they feel during the day and what time they go to bed and wake up and things like that. Um, but on the market, there are sort of more and more devices coming along that try to sort of do poor man's versions of, of, of measuring uh, sleep-related things of like how, whether you're really asleep and, and, and motions and, mm -hmm. and things like that. Are, do you have any recommendations for if, if people who, who have sleep apnea and are using CPAP and want to sort of try to monitor in between actually having sleep studies, do you have any suggestions for sure. products that they can so use? So we don't do repeat sleep studies on patients who are already diagnosed with sleep apnea and on CPAP. Um, we only do another sleep study on to see how they're doing if something's changed in their life, like if they have new symptoms, if they gain weight, if they lose weight, if they have new medications that can worsen sleep apnea, that's when we repeat a sleep study. Otherwise, you get your diagnostic study, you get your CPAP titration study to get you on CPAP, and that's it, okay? Now, in terms of monitoring progress as you go along with CPAP, the, all the CPAP machines nowadays are very sophisticated as, as much as they can be, and they all have night-to-night -night data capturing. They actually capture your, that AHI number. They give you an AHI number. They give you a leak value because if too much leak means you're not getting adequately treated. They even give you how many hours you're using. Um, and this, they give you this data on a night-to-night -night basis so every morning. A lot of my patients love data. Every morning they wake up, they look at that data, and then they write it down, and then they come to my office with a whole month's worth of data. I actually don't need that because the machine actually keeps memory for a year long, or even I think even longer than that. So when, I, when patients come to my office, I download that data, and I can tell how they're doing. And, uh, they, and then they can't lie to me if they're not using it because it gives me compliance data. How many hours they're using on average? A, m a week, a month, six months, and all that. So I know that that helps, but that, that's what we do nowadays. And if you have a machine that doesn't have that data, you gotta ex exchange it out. That's, that's a very old machine. 
<laughs> Do we have time for more questions? Okay. Um, is there a link between sleep apnea and teeth grinding? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay, because what I was thinking before <laughs> is teeth grinding, it can alter the muscles of the jaw. Uh -huh. And as well, like I wear a mouth guard, so like my mouth is partially open when I'm sleeping. So. Yeah, I think um, teeth grinding is a sign that you may have sleep apnea. Uh, so for a lot of, a lot of patients um, who have sleep apnea have teeth grinding too. So that's one of the things we always look for in someone we, we are suspicious for sleep apnea is teeth grinding. And when we treat the sleep apnea, the teeth grinding goes away. Really? Yes. Now, teeth grinding is also due to other reasons, though. Most common reasons are stress, caffeine, alcohol, sleep deprivation. But sleep deprivation is also sleep apnea. It's, it's, yeah, it's considered a, a type of what we call a parasomnia or a, be, a abnormal behavior during sleep. It's something like sleep talking. Okay, well, thank you for the amazingly informative session. Uh, sorry, I was going to ask a little bit more about Can the, you speak a little louder? I can't hear you. Yeah, I, I think our time is up, so... I'm, um, I'm, I mean, uh, it doesn't matter, it's okay. Okay, so... Um, so um, you mentioned something about the use of humidifiers. Did you notice a difference between... Did, has, have your patients noticed a difference between the System 1, which has a, you know, never uh, avoid condensation feature, and uh, any of the older CPAP models that allowed you to set a humidity level slightly higher yeah. than the system one allows. You're saying the PR system one, right? That's right. You obviously know a lot about CPAP. Okay. So the system one is, a, is the, the, the latest model for the Respironix uh, manufacturer CPAP machine. So the, the, the new CPAP machines are, they have changed their algorithm and their structure quite a bit. And they, um, what they do is they, they do climate control. So the humidity and, and too much humidity, which, which, which we call condensation in the, in the CPAP machines, have, we don't see that too much anymore nowadays with the new machines. The PR System 1 has a built-in um, uh, condensation humidity control in, that, in, the, in the CPAP hose itself. So um, my patients find that it, it works very well, the humidity is much better, the condensation doesn't, come, doesn't happen anymore. The other machine that I want to mention is the ResMed S9 machine with the climate control hose, if you're familiar with that. So the, the, there's, a special, there's a special hose that actually controls temperature. Right. So, so my question is, uh, has any of, of your patients come to you and said, I need a humidity level higher than these climate control uh, devices allow me to set? Because you, know, you, you can set it all the way to max, like five. Do some patients need more than that? Yes. And I have the occasional yeah. patient, maybe one in you know, 100 who needs higher humidity. And if that's the case, I use an, a different type of device. I, there's a different manufacturer called the Fisher Paykel. They actually have very, um, they're known for the humidity and I use that machine. I mean, it's like a, mach a humidity like machine. It, okay. it, so yes, there are some patients who need more humidity than that. Okay. And there are patients who hate humidity, don't use the humidity at all. There's some patients who just use a CPAP machine without humidity. So it varies. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, thank Dr. Cao for her time and for all the questions.